on to Genesis chapter 3. So let's just dig right into it because it's a continuation of the narration of what happened after humanity fell into sin or after humanity was created. Now we, we are introduced the prob to the problem of humanity, which is sin and its consequence, death. <clears throat> now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, let's just stop right there. What did God actually say to Adam and Eve about the tree of the knowledge of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're told um, in going back to chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that's what God said. Do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we talked last night about how Adam and Eve only knew good up to that point. So now you have the serpent stepping in, and we're going to talk about him in just a minute. But he says uh, to uh, the woman, he says this to Eve, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So right away, what is the serpent doing? The serpent is misconstruing what it is that uh, God said. Did God tell you that you can't eat of any of the trees in here? In other words, what, what he is doing is he's sowing a sense of discontent with God. Uh, sowing a sense of, wait a minute, why is God keeping me from eating uh, any of the fruit in here? Don't I have the freedom to do anything I want? So he's, he's planting a seed of uh, resentment against God by the question. Now what's interesting is how Eve responds to the question because she says, we're allowed to eat uh, the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she says, neither shall you touch, you, touch it, lest you die. Now, why does she say that? That's not what God said. Um, I think a safe theory is that once the serpent plucked that resentment string, uh, Eve was, you know, saying, we're not allowed to even touch it. It was almost like, what's God hiding from us? You know, why is God trying to keep something good from us? Why is God trying to boss us around? That's kind of the idea. She said, no, God, God said we could eat of all of the fruit but not of the fruit of the tree and not even touch it. Well, God didn't say that. So you can see how through this simple uh, implantation, if you will, of resentment on the part of the serpent, um, Eve kind of has her dukes up a little bit. Now, I want to point out, and I will show it to you when we get there, Eve is not by herself right now. Adam is with her. Sometimes Eve gets a bad rap and, and that you actually have people who have developed so-called theologies saying that women cause the fall of the human race. That's not true. Adam was right there. Eve was the only one who was uh, dealing with the serpent. Uh, Adam was a passive bystander. Uh, 
you know, his role was utterly passive and he was part of the go along to get along gang. So uh, he doesn't get out from under blame either. Now, who is the serpent? The serpent is uh, Satan. Now, snakes or serpents are not intrinsically or inherently, were not intrinsically or inherently evil. They were among uh, the creeping things that God had created. So we have to judge either that the, 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 the devil took on the guise of a serpent or that he demonically entered a serpent. Now, uh, he did both of those things, uh, and angels generally are able to do those kinds of things. So it would not be beyond the capacity of the devil to do that. But we have absolute confirmation of that in the Gospel of John. Take a look at John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8:44 This is part of Jesus confrontation with the Jews who believed in him but who became increasingly scandalized by him and were ultimately scandalized when he said uh, that you know you have to um I guess that was that was an earlier group, but this is a part of a group of of Jewish believers in Christ who were scandalized by him. This was after the feeding of the five thousand. So John eight verse forty four, look at what Jesus says to these people who ostensibly believed in him. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, he's accusing these fellow Jews who were following him and who ostensibly believed in him because of their rejection of the nature of his lordship and his call to repentance and faith in him, um, they were scandalized by Jesus. They'd been scandalized earlier by him talking about the importance of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. If you don't do that, he says, you have no part in me. This is why Holy Communion is so important to uh, we Lutheran Christians. We believe that we partake of Christ's body and blood and that he uh, gives them to us uh, as a way of giving himself to us and giving his forgiveness to us and giving us, if you will, bread for the journey through our life of faith. <clears throat> well, um, this, what Jesus says to them is that the, the devil lied to the human race and murdered the human race from day one. Well, how did he do that? Well, we'll see that in just a moment. He did it in the fall. And of course, through the fall, um, after Adam and Eve had their sons Cain and Abel, an actual murder took place, and every evil, uh, every cataclysmic disaster that happens in the universe, every horrible disease, COVID, cancer, everything, goes back to the devil lying to Adam and Eve and deceiving them and driving a wedge between God and the human race. And here we see in these first few verses of Genesis 3, the beginning of that. So um, let's move on. We've seen Eve's response. Now look at uh, chapter 3, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, 
knowing good and evil. Now, this is the occasion of the devil's lie, the serpent's lie, but let's point something out here. They did not die immediately when they ate of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Death became part of the human experience from that point forward, and we're going to see the implications of that as we go through the chapter. But the fact of the matter is, they did not die immediately. Nonetheless, the serpent told them a lie because he was basically saying there would be no consequence for them uh, disobeying God, uh, God's command that they not eat of that uh, tree, the fruit of that tree. So, as I tell our catechism students, and as some of you probably heard me say before, the serpent, the devil, told the truth in a lying way. And because of his lies, uh, he deceived the human race. They fell into sin and death became part of the experience of humanity. We are born in sin. So the moment we are born, we're born into a, a, an alienation from God, which through Christ, God has bridged. But nonetheless, that means that death is part of the human experience. And then look at what he says in verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It is true that when Adam and Eve bit into the fruit, they knew evil. They had only known good before. So, once again, the serpent is factually correct, but he's also lying in this sense. The clear implication by how he phrases that verse, notice how he puts it, for God knows then when you eat of it. In other words, God is trying to keep something from you. That's the idea. Uh, again, he's trying to play the resentment card. What are you missing out on that God doesn't want you to have? God wants to keep that to himself. Why, why would God want to just keep that to himself? Why wouldn't he want you to have that too? Not understanding that being aware of the existence of evil and how evil operates is, is actually a burden for God. When you are a pure, righteous God, the knowledge of evil is a burden that he did not want to inflict on these children he created out of his love, right? You remember, uh, those of you who are parents, uh, when your kids would misspeak words and you kind of wish they'd always misspeak them because it was so doggone cute? Well, magnify that a zillion, zillion, zillion times, times infinity. Uh, God wanted to protect us from the burden of evil. It wasn't. It was not because he enjoyed evil and was trying to keep us from enjoying ourselves. And you know, this is a, uh, a common idea that people have about God, that God wants to prevent human beings from having fun. <laughs> no, God wants to prevent human beings from dying. Um, and so he shared our death with us on the cross. So but that's the resentment that the serpent is planting in Adam and Eve right now. So let's move on. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Notice that. He was right there the whole time. He didn't interject and say, no, God didn't really say that, or let's, let's go, Eve. 
he went right along and he ate then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths so let's stop right there i've talked about this so i won't belabor the point what they saw at that point was what they had not seen previously in their innocence in their innocence they did not understand that their bodies their minds their lives could be used in sinful or evil ways suddenly they knew shame they had never known shame before because they were good they were in utter innocence now they could imagine evil now this gift of imagination which is part of the uh, being created in the image of god being able to um, act and project how one's actions might um, upbuild the creation that god gave to them remember we talked about that last night now they can also look at the creation. They can look at each other and they can see how they can uh, move uh, negatively. They can do evil things. They can harm the creation. They can harm themselves. They can harm each other. They can act in ways that are contrary to the will of God because now they know not only good, but they know evil. And the problem with evil, of course, is that it takes root in humanity so that God will say later on in the book of Genesis that the imagination of the human uh, mind is evil continuously. That's why evil and good cannot coexist. Now, we can be saints and sinners at the same time because we are still human beings living in this world and we still have not gone through the ultimate crucifixion and resurrection but by grace through faith in Christ we are saved from our sin and we are covered in Christ's righteousness um, and God covers uh, covered people in righteousness who believed in him before Christ came into the world of course Christ simply being God uh, coming into the world. And so when the ancient people of Israel believed in the God of Israel, they were believing in the one who would come into the world as Christ. That's another story, and we'll talk more about the Trinity in just a few minutes, hopefully. So at any rate, um, the fall has happened. Adam and Eve have partaken of the fruit and now their eyes are opened uh, to evil, uh, which they had never seen before. Now, I've mentioned before that some of the ancient rabbis believed that Adam and Eve were created blind and thus were in a relationship of utter dependence on God to lead them. And that at the moment um, they bit into the fruit, their eyes were opened, they saw. Um, you know, it's a good metaphorical way of understanding it. Uh, if you think of innocence as being a state in which one is led by a righteous God and only does righteous things because one doesn't know evil, well, that makes absolute sense. And then the eyes were opened and evil could be seen as well. You can bet that at that very moment, the shame and the horror of it probably caused Adam and Eve to feel immediate regret and remorse. The problem with us is that we've gotten accustomed to evil. We're born into evil. And so it's very difficult for us to understand what a state of righteousness is. It's also very difficult for us to understand the depths of our sin and how desperately we need a savior we don't just have a little bit of a problem with sin we have a fatal disease a fatal condition 
of separation from God. And were it not for God reaching out to us, we would be doomed. We see God acting graciously, though, here for Adam and Eve, even as he um, condemns them for their rebellion, for their decision, um, which they could have avoided uh, because their, their, their wills were not bound to sin. They could have avoided plunging all of their descendants, including you and me, into this condition of sin. But God is gracious to them even then. So here they are, ashamed, aware of evil, uh, plunged into evil, and wanting to hide, not wanting anyone to know, not wanting God to know about their sin, about their the, the, the evil in them at this point. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What was the reaction, you remember, in ancient Israel to God being up on the mountain at Mount Sinai, especially after they saw, you know, Moses come down and his face uh, aglow from the presence of God? They did not want to come into the presence of God. They did not want to be in the presence of his glory. To come into the presence of God's glory is to understand God's perfect righteousness and our unrighteousness. We see with absolute clarity um, the depths of our depravity, if you will, the depths of our sin, the depths of our distance from God. And so um, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, according to the Gospel of John, when Jesus identified it and said, I am he, right? I am the one you're looking for when they came to arrest him. The guards, the, the temple police, uh, who had weapons, fell at Jesus' feet. They recognized they were in the presence uh, of glory. Uh, something similar happened to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration when, you know, up there on the Mount of Transfiguration after Moses and Elijah showed up, uh, it was as though Jesus uncupped his glory for them to see and they fell on their faces in worship. So here are Adam and Eve. They're running from the presence of God. You know, we convey this in our liturgy. And I've talked a little bit about this, but it's worth talking about again. When we uh, begin worship, and some of you will notice that I will do this, when we have the opening hymn and I uh, go to stand before the altar, I don't go right up to the altar because what we're doing is we're coming into God's presence we're coming, we're coming in as sinners into the presence of a sinless God. And so what we do is we confess our sins. It's only after we've confessed our sins and received absolution that I approach the altar. Um, and usually what we, we will do then is, you know, we'll have the, have, have the hymn of praise. But we'll, I'll go up and do the prayer of the day, right? And then we can be seated in the presence of God. And the whole flow of the service, as you've heard me say before, is about gathering intimacy. We come in, once again, strangers, covered in our sin from the past week or the past day. And we ask God's forgiveness and we're able to come to the table and we hear his word and then ultimately we have this intimate act of Jesus giving himself to us and then he says go in peace so what we have here 
is Adam and Eve running from the presence of God. They don't want to come into the presence of God. They know they have sinned and they acknowledge um, their shame and they, they're too ashamed to be in the presence of a holy God. Verse 9, But the Lord God called to man, the man and said to him, Where are you? Now this is what you call... <laughs> It's not as though God did not know the answer to that question. It's a question with a point. You know, you've never shied away about being around me in the past. Where are you? Verse 10, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, that is God. Who told you that you were naked? Right? If you only knew good, you wouldn't have a sense of naked. You would just sense, have a sense of this is who I am. Right? And then God says, Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, that's a rhetorical question. God knows the answer. The man said to him, this is what happens with sin as well. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. I want, to, I want you to turn your attention real quickly to Exodus chapter 33, verse 21. Exodus 33, 21. So just the next book. Exodus 33, 21. Um, make sure I've got it, 3321. Um, and the Lord said, Behold, that's not the right citation. Why did I get that wrong? Hold on here, folks. I do that sometimes, don't I? I write down the wrong chapter and verse. It's Exodus 32, 21, 32, 21. Um, and Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know, the people that blah, blah, blah. So Moses gets angry with Aaron and Aaron blames the people. This was when the people made the bronze serpent and so forth. This is what happens to us when we get caught out in our sin. Our first impulse is to blame someone else. Kids are great at this. Um, uh, our daughter had a pretend friend. It wasn't really a friend. He was just a bad person. And he did all of the, the things that, you know, like messed up her room and things like that. She would, she would blame her, her pretend person for that. And so this is what Adam does. He immediately says, uh, the woman whom you gave to be with me, not only does he blame the woman, he blames God, right? Because God gave the woman to him. This is the same woman about whom he exalted in the previous chapter. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Hey, she did it. And she's the one you gave me. So it's really your fault, God. And that's what we do, right? Why did you make me like this? Uh, people will claim that uh, their sins uh, their violations of God's will stem from how God made them. God didn't make you to be a sinner. Sin is a condition you inherited from your 
forebears. Don't blame the things you do because of that condition on God. It didn't come from God. So Adam tries to blame God. And the woman I really, 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 really loved in that last chapter, you know, just last chapter, Lord, she, she gave her, you gave her to me, and she's the one who gave me the fruit. And so, you know, God is sort of like a parent. He hears the one excuse, uh, the one child blaming the other child. And then we have this in verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, yeah, the serpent deceived her. Why? Because he created a market for her deceit. He created a market for resentment. And not just in her, but in Adam as well. So she did not have to fall for the deceit, but she did. Um, every um, human being who's descended from them since then has had an inborn inclination to sin. Unlike Adam and Eve, our inclination is to cave into every temptation that comes our way. It makes it very easy for the devil, right? That's why we need Christ. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. So she says, basically, the devil made me do it. And then God meets out the condemnation. This is the death and the condition of death. And I want you to notice that the things that he lays out are a consequence of the fall. They're not how he initially engineered the universe to be. Um, uh, in the beginning, he made them, uh, he made the human race, he made them male and female. They both were in the image of God and they shared in that. And uh, part of the restoration that comes to us, as I mentioned last night, I think, is what Paul talks about in Galatians, where he says that in Christ there is no male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. The idea that all of those things, that those divisions that run from the condition of sin have been overturned through Christ by coming into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. So now take a look at what God says. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field? On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, now, uh, this is very interesting because this is the precise point at which biblical scholars and students over the years have said God is giving his promise of a savior. He says offspring, singular, uh, of the woman will bruise your head that of the serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. There will be enmity. But ultimately what's going to happen is the offspring will destroy the power of the serpent. And so the idea is that the one born of woman will destroy the serpent. Take a look at Galatians 4.4. 4. Galatians 4.4. 4. This reflects the understanding of the church. I had someone the other night uh, on Twitter. I quoted Paul on something, and this person said, Paul was a false prophet and a false apostle, and he wasn't of God, and you have to save yourself through works. And I said, well, if you think he is a false prophet, you need to take that up with Jesus. Take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So all the way back at Genesis 3, 14, God's plan was that the offspring of Eve, uh, a, a person born as a son of man, a son of Adama, uh, would come into the world and destroy the power of sin, destroy the power of the serpent, Jesus himself. Now I want you to take a look at another passage, 1 John 3, verse 8. 1 John 3, 8. This is talking about the, uh, the devil's identity, etc. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. In other words, unrepentant. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So um, the New Testament writers believed that God had a plan going and had revealed that plan when uh, he talked with the serpent back in Genesis 3.14. And you see some of the echoes of that in uh, Jesus' um, language and also in the Galatians passage and the first John passage I just read. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth uh, children, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Um, so the idea here is that that was not supposed to be part of the plan. Uh, that childbirth would be excruciating or anything. Um, and now look what happens in verse 17. And to Adam he said, "Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. You shall not eat of it." Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your uh, life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. All right, so what's going on here? I mentioned this last night. When I talked about how God uh, wanted us to be stewards who had dominion over the universe and created new and better things. Uh, God's, you know, it's like the old joke about the pastor who goes and visits the farmer who hasn't been in church for a long time. And the farmer shows him around the farm and, and shows him, you know, all of the things he's done on his farm, and it's a, you know, productive place. And um, and the the pastor says to the farmer, "Well, you know, John, the Lord's been really good to you." He said, "Yeah, but you should have seen the place uh, before I took over." Uh, and that really does reflect. Uh, God gave us this very good world, this tov tov world, but he he wanted us to to join him in stewarding it and making it even better. That's part of the privilege of being human. But now what we see is that that whole project of trying to make the world better becomes more difficult because of the existence of sin and death. Uh, this um, ongoing problem of the human race that we see played out in the news every single day. We see it played out in our relationships every single day. And so um, what, what's, what happens now is that work isn't just all joy as it would have been 
nor is childbirth all joy as it would have been. But now it's clouded by sin. So the whole universe is dealing with the reality of the fact that those who are to have dominion over the universe, the human beings, the only of God's creatures made in the image of God, have now uh, brought the whole creation under, um, under the power of sin, sin, death, and darkness. This is why the devil can say to Jesus when he tempted him, you know, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he says, I, I, it's in my power to give all of these to you. Just bow down to me. And of course, Jesus refused. But it was in his power to give that to Jesus. That was kind of, if you will, the gamble that God took in the incarnation. Jesus could have said, you know what? I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to suffer death. I mean, and after all, I'm not the one who brought this on to the human race. Right? So now what enters into the human picture not only is death, but, you know, the consequences of death, futility, aging, degradation, um, uh, deterioration, all of those things become part of the creation. Um, and that's why God has to bring about a new creation. Um, now, at the end of this, uh, by the way, uh, yeah, at the end of this, in verse 19, he says, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Of course, we, we use that line on Ash Wednesday. Um, and I want you to take a look at a couple of other passages in Scripture real quickly. Job 34, 15. Job 34, 15. Remember, Job comes right before the Psalms. Job 34, 15. All flesh would perish together and a man would return to dust. So you have this idea throughout Scripture. It also comes up again in Romans 5, verse 12. Um, we're made of the dust, and because of sin, we return to the dust. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about if you, if you commit a sin, you're damned to hell and you're left in the dust. It means... So it's talking about the condition of sin, the condition of alienation, which brings death, and also is what causes us to sin. This is why Christ is so important, the one who destroys the power of the devil. All right. Verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all uh, the living. And of course, Eve sounds... Uh, like the Hebrew word for um, one who gives life. Um, and the Lord God, there it is again, Yahweh Elohim, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. That would be superior to the, the uh, fig leaves that they had used. So God is taking care of them, right? When God... Um, confronts us for our sin and lays out consequences for our sin and calls us to repentance and faith in him, it's not because he stopped loving us and it's not because he stopped being gracious to us. In their nakedness and in their shame, he's covering their shame for them. And now we see God acting even more graciously, although some people look at this and wonder. But I, I think here we see God's great graciousness. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden 
to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what's going on here? Doesn't God want us to live forever? Yes, he does. Uh, the tree of life would seem to be a way of making that happen. So what is God doing? God does not want us to live eternally damned, eternally separated from God. If uh, evil humanity eats of the tree of life, that means that there is never an opportunity for their, them to be restored to fellowship with God. They are eternally consigned to a state of uh, a sinful nature. So God is protecting them from that. Okay, Rita says, does the animal skins also point to the necessity of blood for the forgiveness of sins? Uh, it could. I mean, that's I, I that has sometimes been posited, Rita. And I think it does make sense. It also um, um, kind of foreshadows uh, the command of God to Peter to take and eat. You know, even though in the covenant of Israel, there was supposed to be this, you know, some um, um, re restraint in terms of which animals uh, were partaken of. It, it does point to the dominion of the man or humanity over all of creation, that the creation is there for humanity to use, hopefully in a just and fair way and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you understand what I'm saying. But yes, I think it does point to that, to have our sins covered, uh, you know, points to animal sacrifice. And of course, ultimately, the sacrifice of Christ himself, offering his own flesh, his own body and blood on our behalf. That's a great question. And yes, uh, I, I would say absolutely it does. Now, here we have uh, a, a point of debate in verse 22. And I'll try to get through this very quickly. Um, modern scholars, they look at statements like, in verse 22, behold, the man has become like one of us. And they say, oh, this must be a remnant of some ancient narrative in which God is talking to the heavenly council, the heavenly angels. Uh, the early church did not believe that that was the explanation. Take a look at Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, this is a similar use of God um, talking to us. Who's the us? Well, uh, the heavenly council would not have been involved in the creation of the universe. God is the creator, right? So the angels weren't, they were bystanders. They were, they were watching God create the universe. So who's God talking to? God's talking to himself. And in the early church, Augustine and others saw that this was about the Trinity. Uh, from the very beginning, you have uh, the Spirit. And here we have, let us... And now we have, they become like us, knowing good and evil. Well, who knew good and evil? God knew good and evil. So this is an early hint, if you will, <coughs> that God is one, but God has more than one person. Other people have said, well, this is the royal we. We are not amused and so forth. That was a... A much later development uh, in history. Uh, so I believe this is God talking to himself. This is the Trinity conversing about what they're going to do. Uh, and um, 
I've, I've mentioned the Robert Farrar Capon book before. Um, I'll try to remember next week to have uh, have it with me so that I can share with you the one thing where God talks about, I'm going to create the world. Okay, Anne says, God calls Eve Adam's wife after they ate of the tree. Why now? Maybe he does earlier and I missed it. I think it was simply implied and because he gave her to him um, and he said this is bone of my bone flesh of my flesh yeah I don't think he used the term wife before um, but now God calls her his wife yeah I'm not I, I'm not sure about that but that's what I would say I think it was simply implied um, and now, uh, the other thing I want to point out before we uh, close tonight is the use of the phrase tree of life. And we've seen that throughout Genesis. It's mentioned also in Revelation, several places, but I want to take you to just one of those, Revelation 2, verse 7. So we'll go all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 2, verse 7. It says, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, that is the one um, in context here, what they mean by conquers is the one who uh, trusts in Christ and perseveres in their faith in Christ and therefore, um, you know, overcome the temptation to veer away from God and has steadfastly maintained their trust in Christ. I spent some time uh, today studying that, um, getting clear in my mind what um, uh, conquers means here. So, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, it's going right back to Eden. So, what uh, God, what Jesus is saying there in uh, Revelation 2 is that he is going to give us the tree of life in the new paradise, the new heaven and the new earth, and we will live eternally with him. Um, and I'll come to your, your um, what you say there in just a second, Rita, but I just want to point out that the reason we may not know those two rivers of the four rivers that were mentioned earlier, and we don't know the location of Eden, is because God has protected it because he doesn't want us to get at the tree of life before uh, uh, under the power of sin uh, so Christ dies on a tree and he promises the tree of life to those who conquer sin through their persevering faith in him all right Rita says uh, Genesis 2:25. Adam and his wife oh there you go there it is Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, that's in the NIV. Yeah, what have I got in the ESV? What did it say? Yeah, it says the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not the first time it was used. Thanks for pointing that out, Rita. Okay, uh, I've gone over what I expected to go. I hope this was uh, helpful. Um, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this time in your word. We thank you that you are a God of grace and that um, death and sin need not be the last word, that you are anxious to give us life uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that um, we would not live in shame. You don't want us to ever live in shame because Jesus Christ died and rose for us and we can turn to you and be covered in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, so just as we don't want to be prideful, we don't want to be shameful. We don't want to be ashamed rather. We want to live in your grace and we ask you to help us to do that and we ask you, Lord, also to empower us 
to, sh to invite others to share in your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much. Have a, a good evening. Good night's sleep. God bless you. Bye now.